My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC ECHO. Welcome to this week's session, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. Great. Thank you so much for having me, and it's great to see all of you. I am going to cover a couple of different topics, PrEP at the population level, some updates on Depivering Ring, which were big news at Croy, transmission clusters. There, was a, there were a lot of studies, a big focus on that this year. I'm just going to present two that I found the most interesting and outcomes of rapid linkage to care and ART. So the first one is a study from Australia, New South Wales is an area that is approaching the UNAIDS 90-90-90 targets and has a very concentrated HIV epidemic with 80% of new infections in MSM. They made a major effort to rapidly roll out PrEP for MSM and this gave them an opportunity to study the population level effect of that rollout. The eligibility criteria for PrEP for MSM in New South Wales are shown here, along with estimates of HIV incidence in those groups, and those include rectal gonorrhea or chlamydia, infectious syphilis, condomless anal intercourse with viremic HIV positive regular partners, condomless anal intercourse with positive or unknown status partners, and methamphetamine use. They estimated that about 3,700 MSM would be available for this program and eligible. They looked at two outcomes, first an efficacy or within cohort outcome of incidence just in those men who started PrEP, and second a population level or effectiveness outcome in the overall HIV cases in the 12 months prior to their PrEP rollout and the 12 months after finishing the PrEP rollout. So here's what they found. First, they massively underestimated the number of MSM who were eligible for and interested in PrEP. They got to their target within eight months and kept going and enrolled about 8,000 men over the period they initially thought they would enroll 3,700. They had 30% 30 of the men drop off, drop off of PrEP during that 12 months, and this is key because it reminds us that it's a real-world study. That's the level of drop-off that we see very similar in the US. But they didn't lose them to follow-up. They had follow-up HIV testing available for 97% of the cohort. So overall, they had just two new HIV infections in around 3,900 person years of PrEP uptake. Those were both in men who were not on PrEP. One had never started and one stopped a few months before an acute HIV event. That translated to an incidence rate of just 0.05 per 100 person years. And in the overall population, their pre-data shown in blue and their post-data shown in green were also very promising with a 32% reduction in recent infections and a 25% reduction in overall HIV diagnoses. This certainly may reflect some secular trend of decreasing HIV infections and increasing viral suppression, but their interpretation was this was mostly attributable to the massive PrEP rollout. So how about here in the U.S.? Well, the CDC updated their estimates of individuals with PrEP indications, and this is new from their 2015 estimates, and the main difference is that they accounted for between state geographic heterogeneity. So they used some data that the Emory Group published just a couple of years ago that put out estimates of the MSM population in each state and in large urban areas. They applied to that some data from Dave Purcell that estimated the number of MSM who were sexually active in the past year, and then applied to that an assumption that about a quarter of those sexually active MSM were eligible for PrEP. And that's how they came up with the number of MSM who had PrEP indications in each state. They also did this for heterosexuals and people who inject drugs. And what you can see on this slide is the total was not that different, 1.1 million compared to 1.2 million but the composition of the PrEP eligible group was very different, substantially more MSM and substantially fewer heterosexuals. They then looked at race data of PrEP eligibility and uptake. And as you can see here, this is a map of the proportion of adults with PrEP indications who are black by state. And as we would expect from HIV epidemiology and demographics, the majority of those persons were in the southeastern United States and the Midwest. Now, how they estimated PrEP uptake uh, was using a commercial database that, that puts together data on Truvada prescriptions from commercial and mail order pharmacies. This is for sure an underestimate since it excludes many sources and is pretty conservative in determining which Truvada prescriptions are PrEP. 
But with that caveat, they found that especially and key in the two regions where the most people who are black and have indications for PrEP reside, there were substantial uh, racial differences, disparities. They, in fact, are in all regions. So this is a problem and I think something we're increasingly becoming aware of and still challenged to find solutions for. I wanted to present this uh, mainly because it relates to a recent news item here in King County of our second PrEP failure or probable PrEP failure. Any of you who haven't seen that, there's a link on the bottom in case you're interested. The first such failure occurred in 2016 and that was part of what prompted us in public health to start investigating cases of people with HIV who have Truvada resistant or potentially Truvada resistant virus and who are viremic. The goals of this activity are number one, to engage those persons in HIV care and achieve viral suppression, but also to notify them that it's possible they could transmit to partners who are on PrEP. So one key thing to know is that this population of people with viremia and PrEP resistant virus is very small. Among all the new diagnoses in King County between 2008 and 17, it was just three people who had primary TDF FTC resistance. When we look at the overall population of people living with HIV in King County, which is around 7,000, there were 12 people who had a genotype and measured uh, TDF-FTC resistance and substantial viremia. And if we apply those estimates to the proportion of the population we didn't have genotype information for, that still suggests it's only 21 people we're talking about countywide, again, a very small group. When we investigated these cases, a substantial number were no longer viremic. They had died or relocated, so they weren't at risk for transmitting HIV. Another number, eight and five, were people who were attempting to really re-engage in care and get virally suppressed, and then just five who declined assistance for various reasons. So important to note PrEP failures, but really PrEP is still highly effective and transmitted resistance is rare. So switching now to another form of PrEP, the Depivirine ring. It, two years ago at Croy, there were two phase three trials, one presented by Jared Baton's group, who's here at University of Washington, that showed a 30% reduction in HIV incidence with use of a monthly Depivirine vaginal ring. That was the Aspire and the ring study. Both of these studies went on to have open label trial extensions where they offered enrollment to all women who were in the study who tested HIV negative at the end of the study and were not pregnant and followed those women. The outcomes here, again, were really encouraging. So HOPE was the open label study that came after Aspire. They had very high uptake of the Depivirine ring. 92% of the women in the original study chose to use it. Higher adherence in open label than in the clinical trial, 89 versus 77. And an HIV incidence of 1.9 compared to the placebo arm in Aspire of 4.5 per 100 person years. The companion study was DREAM. This was the open label extension of the RING study. They also found very high uptake, much higher adherence rates in their open label extension than in the original clinical trial, and similar HIV incidence with 1.8 per 100 person years compared to 4.1. Now this placebo arm that's compared in the phase three study didn't happen at the same time as the open label extension. So both groups did some sophisticated analytics to estimate in a counterfactual scenario what would have been the HIV incidence in a control, placebo control group. And they came up with really similar estimates, 3.9 and 4.1 per 100 person years. Again, showing depivirine ring seems to be not only very efficacious, but very effective. And that when women know the safety profile and effectiveness of the ring, they are even more likely to use it in the real world scenario. Okay, I'm going to switch gears now to talk a bit about rapidly growing transmission clusters. So for anyone who uh, doesn't know as much about this topic, when we send a genotype clinically for our HIV nucleotide sequence, pardon me, to determine drug resistance primarily, those nucleotide sequences are compiled and reported to public health. That lets health departments determine and identify clustered cases, those that have genetically similar HIV. And CDC now funds health departments to use phylogenetic data to focus prevention efforts. Still remains to be seen exactly how that will be done and what that will add to current public health efforts. They reported outcomes from 27 jurisdictions <coughs> with an objective of detecting rapidly growing clusters to prompt public health action. 
They identified those priority clusters as those that were both recent, meaning they'd had cases within the past three years, and rapid, meaning at least five new individuals in the cluster in the past year. They identified 60 priority clusters out of about 52,000 people with newly diagnosed HIV, and those clusters had between 5 and 42 people in them. The transmission rate in these clusters was substantially higher than that in the U.S. overall. So in the U.S. overall, estimated to be 4 per 100,000 person years, and in these transmission clusters had a median of 42 per 100,000 person years. When they looked at the characteristics of cases that clustered versus those that didn't cluster, it was clear that MSM and younger cases were more likely to cluster, which makes sense since that's the group at most risk for new, new HIV acquisition. Also that that population was substantially higher proportion Latino. However, they made the point in the Q&A session that this was driven by a few jurisdictions, and so I think Texas in particular had an outsized influence on this, and it doesn't necessarily reflect trends in the U.S. as a whole. Another one that was interesting to me was from Los Angeles County. So they looked at clusters among trans women. And from the health department perspective, it's very difficult to identify cases that occur in trans persons because traditionally and ongoing, CDC categories of transmission risk factors don't allow for differentiation of birth sex and current gender identity. For that reason, trans women who have a very high rate of HIV are typically put as MSM or female heterosexuals in HIV surveillance. Los Angeles, though, does collect data on this, and they are able to distinguish transgender women who also inject drugs and transgender women who likely acquired HIV through sex. And they looked at their clusters uh, to identify what they could find about trans women in clusters. First, when they looked at the likelihood of clustering, meaning relating phylogenetically to any other HIV case, they found that transgender women clustered at the highest frequency. And when they looked at who they clustered with, the transgender women did cluster assortively, assortatively, pardon me, with both other transgender women and with cis males, but less than expected with MSM. So this indicates not necessarily that the, not probably not that the trans women are having sex with each other, but rather that they are in the same sexual networks, also with cisgender men. And the group then concluded that genetic partners of transgender women are attractive targets for public health services because they may be able to identify other transgender women among their sexual contacts. Okay, last study I'm going to review was some outcomes data from San Francisco. In 2015, the city and county implemented a protocol they call the RAPID protocol after a successful pilot. The RAPID protocol is to ensure that all new HIV diagnoses, people with new HIV diagnoses, are linked to care within five working days. The goal is actually within one working day or same working day. At the first visit, ART is started unless there is a risk for fatal iris, and the health department there worked very closely with providers to try and get to the point where this was standard of care. They looked at their outcomes by year of new cases, and as you can see, there was a substantially shorter time from diagnosis to care initiation, from the first care visit to ART start, and from ART start to viral suppression, which translated to a shorter overall time from diagnosis to viral suppression.